Greetings from the grandstand at Keeneland. It's relatively empty right now as we record on a Thursday morning with training still going on behind me on the main track. But come Friday and Saturday, this place is going to be packed, full of fans watching the 39th annual Breeders' Cup. This will be the third time it's been here. In 2015, the star was American Pharaoh. In 2020, well, you could say it was COVID, but uh, Authentic had something to say as well. And in 2022, it's setting up for Flightline. Acclaimed the world's best active racehorse. Will he punctuate his undefeated record with an odds-on victory in the $6 million classic? More important for our purposes, at those odds, how do you bet it? And in fact, how do you bet all 14 races? Well, we're going to preview all 14 races with our team of handicappers. Let's go ahead and introduce them now, starting with our rookie on the hardcore pod. But make no mistake, he's been a serious horse player for more than 30 years. You can see his work at Charting Horse Value when you check out our handicapping tools at Horse Racing Nation. We'll give you more details on that in specific shortly. First impressions now, the Breeders' Cup from Texas, where we hear from Jeff Bessa. Jeff, your snapshot of what's about to go on here at Keeneland. Well, it's an incredible, uh, incredible event. I've been watching it since, I think my very first one I watched was Ferdinand Alasheba. And, uh, you know, but the, the, they go back, the very first Breeders' Cup Classic is one of the most memorable of all time. But it's just an incredible two days of racing. Uh, I don't feel it's even well known enough outside of uh, the horse racing community, but great, great couple of days of racing. My biggest takeaway, and I've made the most money when I've bet the simplest. You can hit 20 to one long shots in any race on this card. You could hit gigantic 200 to one doubles uh, and you could hit them, you know, 20, 40, hundred dollars. And then all of a sudden you got 2000, 10,000. So don't, you don't have to be spreading so crazy and so wild. You only have to be right a few times and you can have a phenomenal wagering time at the Breeders' Cup. I'll look forward to that and look forward to your advice to get from point A to point B in that regard, as I will too with one of our most popular handicappers is on video streams at Horse Racing Nation and on social media with her brand, Outrun the Odds. She's made some significant scores on multi-race wagers in her first year at Horse Racing Nation. No pressure to repeat that. Back in Louisville at the home office here on the Zoom call is Sarah L. Bodwe. Sarah, your, your, uh, your early thoughts on the Breeders' Cup here at Keeneland. <laughs> Uh, I'm excited to go. This is going to be the first one that I actually get to attend and what a first one to go to with all the star power that we've been following all year. And um, I know everyone's kind of saying Flightland is the, like the only horse in the race with all the media <laughs> coverage that he's getting. But I think that we're truly in to see one of uh, the really special horses of our lifetimes. And I'm really just looking forward to taking it all in and enjoying it and hopefully cashing a few wagers and look who's late to the party. Yeah. Well, he wasn't late. Now, now, Sarah, now see, you know what you did there? <laughs> For anyone listening on the podcast, they don't know. <laughs> but well, if you're watching watch the video, if you're watching the video, you just saw <laughs> our, our final face on the familiar one pop on because he loves to, you know, make an entrance. Make there, an entrance. Just, make an it took entrance. Took me a while to get to thistle down. <laughs> it's, that's right. That's a real vision of thistle down behind him, just as it's this actually is real behind me here at Keeneland. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. 2011 back there. We, we got it all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, yeah, I, I just saw Ford Fairlane behind him. Uh, he's been with us for about a year now at horse racing nation. Of course, you remember from all those days at Churchill Downs, a man who's made a science of fair odds. You've been reading that at horse racing nation and return on investment, which you've been hearing about from him forever from FO and ROI to EJXD2 on Twitter. It's like an eye chart with Ed DeRosa back at the home office. Ed, your initial thoughts about Breeders' Cup 2022? Uh, to me, uh, this big exercise in bankroll management, because it seems like all my strong opinions are on Saturday. And as a avid, excitable horse player, certainly going to be involved on Friday. Yeah. Uh, but, but very much going to want to make sure that I compartmentalize my opinions, push my stronger ones. And as it turns out, most of my stronger ones are on Saturday. So wouldn't mind chipping up a little bit, but we're saving the heavy, heavy ammunition for the, uh, the big day. So in a way, you're making two late entrances 
<laughs> yes. All right. Fair enough. Hey, listen, we're going to get into the meat of the program first for the Friday races in just a moment. But let me go ahead and uh, jump back to, well, what I was talking about a little bit earlier with what Jeff does. And that is, of course, charting horse value. And that is one of our handicapping tools at horseracingnation.com. Charting horse value. Jeff created that. And, and, of course, you've heard him making winning picks on this podcast when he's been on in our other forms and different places where you can consume him. And he's part of our handicapping rotation. Charting horse value should be part of yours. If you are trying to save time mapping out your bets, it's a handicapping time saver that identifies spot plays, value opportunities, all thanks to our advanced statistical analysis. As much as I might try to twist Jeff's arm to find out what's in that formula, well, let's just say that we can give you broad brush strokes without getting into the proprietaries, trainer, jockey, form cycle, and a lot more. And with an exclusive formula that I just mentioned, it's ranking horses in a unique way. And it's available for every track every day. And you better believe it's something you want for the Breeders' Cup. So how do you find it? Go to picks dot horse racing nation dot com p i c k s dot horse racing nation dot com look for charting horse value you can't miss it you don't want to miss it it's one of our handicapping tools from horse racing nation if you're consuming this preview as usual through our podcast platform let me tell you that you can see what you're hearing today check out this pop-up episode of the ron flatter racing pod at the horse racing nation page on youtube where Ed and Sarah are regulars with handicapping advice all year long. And if you're listening after midday Thursday on the pod, but you'd rather see what's going on, then just go ahead and dart over there, youtube.com slash horse racing nation. Quick note, updated weather forecast. National Weather Service says sunny, high of 76 for day one of the Breeders' Cup on Friday. All too typical conditions here in Kentucky during the summer and fall. It's been a <laughs> drought time. Saturday, though, we're hearing about now a 30% chance of afternoon showers with a high near 78, but the ground here has been like dry. It's been just sucking out whatever moisture comes into it, and so we're expecting fast and firm throughout the Breeders' Cup. So let's go ahead and start. Friday's program, as far as the 14 big races are concerned, we open at 3 o'clock Eastern with the Juvenile Turf Sprint. Five and a half furlongs on the grass. 12 are entered, plus three also eligibles. Number 12, the Platinum Queen. Seven to two on the morning line for Richard Fahey and Holly Doyle coming over from Europe. Winner of the Prix de la Bay on the very soft going along, Sean, last time out. That's who the favorite is in terms of the program. Nick Tamaro setting the morning line for all these races. Sarah, you go ahead and set the stage first as we look at the juvenile turf sprint. You know, this race, I feel like I spent more time on than I did a lot of the other races, just because we have so many European contenders coming over and I'm a big replay watcher. So uh, thankfully these careers are short for these two year olds and you can get through watching all of those replays in more of a timely fashion than you can by watching everybody's entire career. Um, I'm looking to try to beat the favorite in this spot, the post draw all the way to the outside. I feel as though with the platinum queen, everybody's just going to see that she has defeated older males. And then that's it. That's the only criteria that's good enough for a spot like this. But I don't know. She has no left-hand turn experience. She's never gone beyond the five furlong. She's only gone just five instead of others that have experimented with the five and a half and that have gone a little bit further as well. So at a short price, all the way to the outside with all of these ifs and variables for a horse like this, I, I kind of wanted to look elsewhere for a better price. And I'm going to tell you all about the longest shot in the field that I like a little bit. Once I turn the page to her, and that's going to be the number eight American Apple, who I can make a case for at a huge price in a spot like this, because you can kind of throw out the first few starts. She didn't really want to be on the dirt. Then they try the turf for the first time and she's going a mile. Maybe she doesn't want to go that far. They get to the sprint distance on the grass. Finally, she breaks her maiden and then she goes right into stakes company and goes off at a huge price, winning the matron at Belmont at the big A over two horses that were also the second and third place finishers to the Wesley Ward trainee, Love Reigns, who's the second choice on the morning line. Uh, so if you take those two and use them as your yardstick with which to measure this horse by, 
I think that with the price discrepancy, you're looking at a horse that may offer some value in a spot like this. All right, Ed. Uh, well, I agree with Sarah on trying to take a shot against uh, the post in particular, just uh, two-year-olds sprinting outside. Like that to me is like automatically why would you want a short price anyway? Uh, I'm on a couple 15 to one shots on the morning line, whether we actually get that remains to be seen, but I thought dramatized, uh, not necessarily the last race, but two back in the Queen Mary, uh, which was five furlongs. And I was looking at a couple of the Europeans that uh, excelled at five uh, versus six, because I do think five and a half is a little sharper. And especially in Europe, as they begin to stretch out to six, and when we talk about the, uh, the, the juvenile and juvenile Phillies turf races to come, which are two turn miles, uh, it, really speaks to me when the, the horses go longer there. Uh, and I think dramatized having excelled at five just kind of stuck out to me at 15 to one. And we don't have a lot of figures to go on, which is my style of handicapping. Sarah mentioned replays, but Brisnet, which does supply some of our free PPs at HRN, they have something called class ratings in their PPs and they're included with the international races and dramatized absolutely fits very favorably uh, among the others uh, when it comes to yeah, the class ratings, as does Persian Force, Frankie DeTori up. And that's another situation. I really like that that one broke its maiden going five, then a steady stream of six for long races. But uh, another situation where I kind of see maybe the cutback is in this one's favor. Now, you do get the turn, which is kind of mitigating perhaps, but you get Frankie DeTori, you get 15 to one on the line, and you get a number from Brisnet that says, uh, he is competitive as well. So it's 4-6 for me uh, in the juvenile turf sprint. All right, Jeff. Okay, so uh, just thank you so much for mentioning charting horse value, Ron. Two things that I'm going to uh, explain. First of all, I give an odds line on my charts for every horse in the race. I can compare that to the morning line and determine where I think the value is. That's the number one thing. The second thing is I look at a variety of factors, including the speed, the jockey, the trainer, the pace, uh, and the odds line. And I come up with a letter grade. And of course, as most people know, A is the best letter grade, B, C, et cetera. This race is the only one out of 14 that does not have an A horse. This is a very wide open race, very difficult to handicap. It's also the first time that they're running for a million dollars in this sprint. And it's a grade one. I'm pretty sure this was a $500,000 race, grade two previously. And now you're seeing a lot more Europeans showing up with a lot more credentials. Okay. So I, I first of all, I think um, uh, both Sarah and Ed had some good, good picks there. Very wide open. I'm going to go a different route. I'm going with Speedboat Beach. It's very unusual to see Baffert with a very fast sprinter these days. Although he is good with them. He won two sprints with Midnight Loop. Uh, and this horse is just lightning fast. I think he set a track record at Del Mar going 101 of four on the dirt, going five and a half furlongs. And then uh, they tried him on the turf to see if he could go here. And he went extremely fast, 55 and one for five furlongs. The horse is firing bullets. The wide draw is a little bit of concern. But I think this horse is going to come flying out of the gate, get a decent spot going into the turn, and certainly is one that could win. He's six to one morning line. Odds could change. Odds could drift up on this horse. Uh, I'm going Speedboat Beach. All right. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to look at Wesley Ward and Love Reigns, a winner at five and a half furlongs in the stakes race at Saratoga. Also, I'm going to maybe do a little sprinkle with Oxymore for Chad Brown and Jose Ortiz. Uh, is a half length from being three for three uh, in a career ranking as far as record is concerned. So that's the juvenile turf sprint. Let's go now to the juvenile Phillies, 340 Eastern time on Friday. It's a mile and a 16th. A full field of 14 will be in this one. Chocolate gelato for Todd Fletcher with Irod Ortiz up has won the last two races. And she also includes in that a win in the slop in the frisette at Saratoga, but it's been that long since she has raced. Seven to two on the morning line. Ed, we'll start with you. Well, I think what's going to be a theme this uh, weekend is the other Fletcher. 
some of these races. And for me, I like atomically. I see that this filly has done nothing wrong. And I can hear Mark Midland saying, Gervins don't like to route. Well, she did find last out routing. The number came back really strong. And we're getting 12 to 1 on a filly who's done nothing wrong in Stakes Company. This is grade one. It's open company. But I love the price. I love Saya's getting aboard. I love the private purchase. I love her at a price. She's my best bet of the Friday card. All right. Jeff? Going chop chop. Chop chop probably should be undefeated. Ran the first two times on turf. And then they tried uh, the this Brad Cox tried her on the turf, on the dirt. And she lost by a nose after a very rough trip, broke extremely slow, was closing like a fl- freight train, and uh, probably should be undefeated. I think this horse turns the table on Wonder Wheel, uh, and I'm going chop chop. All right, Sarah. This is one of my kind of more out there Breeders' Cup opinions in general. I'm sticking with number 11, American Rockette, just because I I think that maybe if even if this isn't the day for her, this horse has a bright future and I can forgive the uh, off track non effort last time out in the frisette. There's no way that you can convince me that she wouldn't have won the spin away with a clean break after breaking all the way to the outside and being so compromised early. I know that this is obviously much tougher company, but I've seen this horse overcome something and a lot of these other shorter prices. I have not seen that yet. All right. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm looking at Wonder Wheel here for Mark Cassie. Tyler Gaffalione will be up three starts, two wins and a second. And perhaps most important, won the Alcibiades here at Keeneland last out. And so already a grade one and on the track. And so uh, that's why I'm looking at her. At 4.20 Eastern time on Friday, it's the Juvenile Phillies turf. It will go one mile here on the grass with 14 plus two also eligibles. Meditate on the ship for Aiden O'Brien, one of the seven that he has entered in races this week in the Breeders' Cup, coming over to try to add to his 13 Breeders' Cup scores, most of any international trainer. Ryan Moore gets the ride. Meditate, the number 10 horse, is on a four race winning streak or was and then came two group one races but came two good second place finishes in each case though they were shy of a mile the problem here is this is the first time that she will be going a mile the number 10 horse four to one on the morning line right there four to one Uh, jeff that tells you wide open race doesn't it it does and you gave all the reasons why you probably need to fade meditate and another one is uh, European fillies shipping over don't do that well. I, maybe it's just too stressful on a filly at this young age, but they're very uh, beatable, even at short prices in the Breeders' Cup uh, juvenile filly race uh, on the turf here. So I'm going a different direction. I loved the Natalma prep at Woodbine. I think there's actually three horses coming out of that prep you could look at. But I'm going to go with Cairo Consort, mm. who's 12 to 1. Uh, you know, again, had a little bit of a rough trip, uh, b- getting blocked, but still ran on, only lost by a length to last call who's in this race. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Cairo Consort can get the uh, turn on that horse this time. It looks like a great wager at 12 to 1. Now by Cairo Prince, trained by Nathan Squires with Joel Rosario up. Sarah, how about you? Well, I'm looking at the same prep race as Jeff is, but I'm going to go with the number 11 G Lori for Graham Motion. This was one that broke her maiden at Colonial and then ran third in her first try versus graded stakes company right into that grade one Natalma. Had a little bit of traffic trouble in there. I feel like Graham Motion's not the type to really spot his horses so aggressively if they're not capable. And she puts the blinkers on for a spot like this. So I'm I'm interested to see what she can do in here. Yeah. And in fact, yeah, the blinkers on move and the, uh, this is a, a trainer who certainly knows his way around doing that. Ed, what about you in terms of the uh, this particular race with the Juvenile Phillies turf? I'm not going to say the outside post bothers me on Meditate because the three I like are to her outside. I'm glad Sarah mentioned G. Lori, who I think is right there. But uh, Chikara is my top pick. Uh, Zyger- Zygera, 13 is what you need to know. Uh, Leperu wouldn't be a Breeders' Cup if I didn't have him on top somewhere. They tried dirt. I don't blame the try. They wanted to see what they had there. Uh, didn't work out in the Alcibiades. The uh, the turf try maiden breaker, I think, is good enough with improvement. She fits with these. I actually think she's going to be a longer price than G. Laurie, despite the morning line. 
So that speaks to me too. Of the Europeans, I like Midnight Mile the best. So the old 11, 12, 13 for me in the juvenile Phillies turf. Yeah, I, I, I think the it's going to be a popular fade against Meditate. And I'm going to do so uh, with a, a long shot with Shug McGahee training Pleasant Passage, the number five horse, 12 to one on the line. Erod Ortiz will be up two for two. I grant you, yeah, a modest pair of races, uh, but beat two of these in the Miss Grillo at back at uh, Belmont at Aqueduct la last out. And also not insignificant, uh, has a top last Briz rating in terms of most recent performance. So that's why I'm looking at, uh, albeit, uh, not maybe the most flashy resume. I'm going to look at Pleasant Passage for the Juvenile Phillies turf. At 5 o'clock Eastern time, it's the Juvenile. No, it's not the last of the Future Stars races. They changed it up because you have three turf races and two dirt. They, they went ahead and said, all right, we'll go ahead and uh, put the uh, Juvenile turf last in terms of the Breeders' Cup races on Friday. So no adjustment of your program is necessary. Yes, the Juvenile a mile and a 16th with a 10 entered cave rock. Yeah. Cave rock. We've heard a lot about him. Uh, the number three horse for Bob Baffert, making his return to Kentucky. Juan Hernandez, who's certainly been a hot jockey in California this year. Cave rock, not only is three for three, but has a pair of grade one wins in the Del Mar futurity in the American Pharaoh. And with one of the two top buyer speed figures, according to daily racing form among two-year-olds, who have raced this year. My question beyond, all right, Sarah, I'll start with you. If you go with Cave Rock, are you singling? And uh, if you're going vertical, how do you bet the race at such short odds on the favorite? Well, I think if your opinion is that you like Cave Rock, mm -hmm. then with the way that the prices are, it makes sense to just single him if you're playing a multi-race wager. He's going to be a short price. And I, if you like him and you trust him, that's your opinion and you should stick to it. If you're trying to beat him, I think that you can afford to throw in a couple more horses because you're going to get paid a lot more if you defeat what is probably going to be the shortest favorite on the Friday card. And honestly, maybe even the entire Breeders' Cup, depending on how things go on Saturday. I'm not trying to beat him. I think that if Loggins was in this race for Brad Cox, we'd have yet another early pace presence and we could see more of a meltdown. But with the way that Keeneland is so kind to speed and his ability to have already gone this mile and a 16th distance, I don't want him next year going a mile and a quarter, but I think that he's very dangerous in this spot on Friday. All right, Ed. Well, the good news is I haven't picked a favorite yet. So I feel like even with Cave Rock <laughs> on some tickets, uh, I'm not, going to be in a underwater situation with my pick five that said i am trying to beat him because i think forte is absolutely the right price in this race with the win the track and distance i referenced earlier i'm a numbers guy cave rock has thrown steady tens on ragazin lower number the better forte is at 11 and he paired that at keeneland and i think uh, he has a chance at what five six times the price of cave rock to at least pick up a point on that one going a mile and the 16th at a track he's already won at. So it's definitely a price play, admittedly. Cave Rock looks amazing on paper. Those PPs and the buyers and Bristnet ratings tower over the rest. But at these prices, if I'm going to take the time to look at Ragazin, this is the time to use it and Forte fits. All right, Jeff. Yeah, I think Cave Rock's the most likely winner on Friday and possibly the entire weekend. And um, looks just much faster than anyone else here. He's going to win. Uh, I'm going to give you another horse you could use underneath in a vertical. And that's Lost Ark, who was in that race with Forte. Had some significant trouble uh, and w closed quite well. Passed a lot of horses in the stretch. Finished six. Was beaten a long way. But I think this horse is a lot better than that outing. And you're getting 20 to 1. And if you could get that horse in second or third, which I think is very possible, you could set up a decent payoff with uh, Cave Rock on top. Yeah, and I think you can also make the argument too, Jeff, that with uh, as you look at Lost Ark, this is a horse that had trouble in that last race uh, in the Breeders' Futurity here. I mean, you're talking about uh, being steadied early and then checking, uh, you know, a little less than a quarter mile to go. And, and so 
Yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. I, I, I can certainly uh, see the point you're making there. As far as I'm concerned, if I was going to go against Cave Rock or if I'm looking to go uh, to try to uh, add something for exotics, I'm looking at verifying for Brad Cox with Joel Rosario up. He won his debut and then was second in the slop in the champagne, but ran on late in that race. And I felt like that was a fairly impressive finish, despite the fact that the conditions might not have been favorable to him. So again, I'm just looking for a price. They're certainly going to find one uh, with verifying uh, maybe to add onto the card, but I, yeah, I'm all about cave rock in this one too. And by the way, Sarah, you mentioned something and I'd like to kind of bounce it around here really uh, quickly before we get to the juvenile turf. Uh, I saw the same thing you did in terms of the fall meet, especially early in the meet, maybe not so much later, but the, the speed, I don't want to say bias, but certainly speed favoring. I mean, what does everybody else, or what, let's, let me throw it out to the, the panel here and find out what you think about whether there could be a bias here uh, in the Breeders' Cup at Keeneland. Well, I don't even know if it's so much a bias at this point, but the, just the way these races play with the short stretch, I have found over the years it's ebbed a little bit. You don't absolutely need the lead, but if you haven't made your move or in, or in position turning for home, uh, unless you're a horse of a central qualities uh, class and the race melts down like it did that year uh, with uh, the Theodora horse in the mix and Hot Rod Charlie, you're not closing from the cloud. So, you know, the, the configuration, if you have distance concerns with K rock certainly helps that it's the short stretch. If this were a mile and a 16th at Churchill, probably be a, a different equation and you might even be six or seven to five, but Keeneland is a great location for K rock this year. And Jeff. Yeah, I think the, uh, I, I looked at the data at Keeneland and first of all, the track could be very different on this weekend than it was. The very true. But uh, it looked to me like for routing, you can win off the pace, but not as a closer. Okay, I'm talking dirt now. Uh, so you don't you don't want to be a closer at all routing, but you can win from you know in, in the mid pack or pressing. Sprinting, you definitely wanted to be on or close to the lead, but most of the sprints are six furlongs. And you know one thing to consider for the seven furlong sprints is horses cutting back can do very well. And uh, uh, especially if there's a fast pace, you could probably look at some closers. But in general, I felt like Keeneland was favoring speed sprinting on the dirt. Uh, and then on the turf, you definitely don't want a deep closer on a turf sprint anywhere, really. Okay. But Keeneland showed that. Yeah. And then for the turf routes, you do want to be a closer. You do want late speed. Yes. Okay. At Keeneland. So turf routes, I was favoring uh, closers. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many, uh, in terms of, yeah, the two-turn grass races, it just seemed like, you know, they were coming five wide at the line all the time in that one. Sarah, do you have anything to add to your initial thoughts on that? No, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. I agree with what um, both Ed and Jeff have said about how these courses have both been playing and what kind of horse you want to have for the most success on those surfaces. Well, let's get to the turf uh, for the finale, at least in terms of the Breeders' Cup races on Friday. And at 540 Eastern, the juvenile turf will go a mile around the two turns. 14 are in with Silver Knot coming over for Charlie Appleby. Haven't mentioned the name Appleby. I haven't mentioned the name Appleby yet. I, you know, I think I've heard it here elsewhere. Uh, but uh, you're going to hear it a lot. Uh, we've heard it a lot in recent times. The Godolphin trainer has really made his scores. And I even asked Aiden O'Brien about this. You'll hear it on the podcast Friday. And he was joking that, yeah, maybe he can learn something from Charlie Appleby. And I'm like, yeah, well, maybe it worked the other way around. And some of what the master was teaching to the student has come to pass here. But uh, silver knot for Appleby and William Buick riding. Uh, Appleby won this race last year, of course, with modern games. We could get into all the histrionics that went along with the uh, the premature evacuation by the uh, veterinarian who decided that eh, modern games might have been hurt. He wasn't stakes money only he wins the race and now silver knot will try to make a two in a row for appleby a winner of the uh, group three autumn stakes most recently at new market all right after all that preamble ed what do you think uh certainly the horse to beat i'm going to try to beat him one of my favorite thoughts as a handicapper is thinking about what if what if this horse were trained by someone so or different connections and packs a wallop checks that box for me uh, the race is in California, unfortunately, with the way the industry has gone there. They just don't have these grade one turf races, grade two, like Naira does. Right. But if these PPs belong to a Chad Brown trainee, 
and you just swap the Zuma Beach with the with anticipation or whatever it is at, at Bach. Uh, this horse would unquestionably be the second choice with silver knot mm. and lower than six to one. Instead, we get Jeff Mullen shipping from California, but Pax Wallop absolutely fits with this group, saves ground early. So you know, Mike Smith uh, is going to need to find a seam somewhere because he's not going to come up the rail late. But if this one gets a trip. I think he absolutely fits six to one's the right price. Paxawallop for me in the juvenile turf. Mm, yeah, Paxawallop, winner of the Del Mar uh, Phillies juvenile turf and the, the uh, pardon me, the Del Mar juvenile turf. No, we didn't change his gender all of a sudden. Zuma Beach was the other race most recently, a pair of grade threes. I don't think I mentioned uh, Silver Knot three to one on the morning line. Jeff, you targeting uh, in that direction or going elsewhere? My top pick is also Paxawallop. Um, okay. The only concern I have is his running style and his efforts has been forwardly placed. And I, as I talked about earlier, this race has been favoring, this uh, track has been favoring closers. But I do agree the trip is there for the taking from the two hole. And this is my top pick. But since Ed picked it, I will also give you another, you know, good horse. And that's, and the winner is, uh, that's the six horse, won the local prep very impressively. That race had an extremely fast pace. Um, and there's no guarantee the same will happen uh, on Friday. But and the winner is closed very strongly and went away one by two and three quarters, which in turf racing, that's extremely impressive. That horse won the local prep. And uh, that's the other horse I like. Yeah. And if you want to toggle back to last week's podcast last Friday, we had Wayne Catalano on talking about and the winner is um, as well as his two that are going to be appearing on Saturday. Uh, Wayne trying to add to four Breeders' Cup victories. Uh, to his training total. Sarah? I agree that Paxawallop is going to be on the tickets, but I also want to take a shot with, with the number nine, Nagarok, for Graham Motion, who I'm hoping has a great day on Friday for me and some of the price horses that I like of his. This one is stretching out to the mile distance or, or mile for the first time, having gone six furlongs, but Graham Motion has good stats with sprints to routes. I picked him in the futurity just because I'd seen so much versatility in his running style. He can come from off the pace. He can go wide. He can be close up. And I think that having a horse where you can make whatever trip is given to you, depending on what happens early, is going to be in your favor. And he's a huge price at 20 to one. Okay. Uh, the price I'm Sarah, looking do you at make is anything of the trainer willing to sell a horse named oh, after yeah. him. No, we don't oh. know what, how much money he got. <laughs> I'd sell you for the right price. <laughs> Heck of gum. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's, wow. I, I, I'm going to have to start watching the futures on Ed DeRosa here uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at a price, but not as much as uh, Sarah might be at 20 to 1. I'm looking at Victoria Road at 8 to 1. Uh, three times a winner in three races most recently. And as far as uh, you're looking at the Aiden O'Brien connection again, and Ryan Moore is up. And uh, we're also looking at uh, a last out having won the pre de Conde, uh, a group three on soft going at Chantilly. That was back in September. But this horse uh, has also won on a good going, having done so at Deauville in France as well. So it looks fairly versatile. I'm hoping at least that's the case in terms of him. Okay, so we've gotten through the Friday Breeders' Cup races. We've got nine to tee up for you on Saturday. We also want to make sure that we don't leave the juveniles without reflecting on the fact that, of course, because they're two-year-olds, they don't have a big track record. Well, you can even go uh, one more step in that direction. What do you do with horses that have just, you know, they've never run? First-time starters. If you're flying blind betting those, ah, have I got some help for you. If you're just looking at that workout line or maybe you're misleading yourself, leaning hard on the sale price of the horse or the breeding fee or whatever it might be, what you need to do is check out first-timer power ratings at horseracingnation.com. It's a ranking system that we've developed. It's a one through five. Pretty simple when you read it because you're really looking for fives. Of course, you're trying to equate that with value. If everybody else is looking at fives and you're seeing four to five odds, all right, well, maybe you look elsewhere, start to look at the fours. You start to find the reasons that these first timers are getting these numbers. Now, the fives are winning at about a 20% clip. That's probably why you, you want to start looking there. 
you should certainly consider them before you make your bet. But why don't you, you know, go ahead and look this up for yourself and not go, what's he talking about with the ones and the twos and the fives? When you're handicapping these maidens, you're looking for this sort of help. So when you introduce yourself to this report, the first timer power ratings, you'll find out that this proprietary information is really good for you to use and you'll start to apply it. And hopefully you'll start to see some success at the window or in your ADW account. First timer power ratings available every day for every track. Look for them at picks.horseracingnation.com. Just for you, first timer power ratings, picks, P I C K S, picks.horseracingnation.com. This and Ron, is. There are uh, first time starters both on Friday and Saturday. Uh, that's, that's true. And not just either. That's right. And let's not forget, it's not just the Breeders' Cup card where you can find all this happening. Here at Keeneland, it is the Breeders' Cup, and we are about to take a look at the nine Saturday races with our rotation of handicappers, Ed DeRosa, Sarah L. Bodwi, Jeff Bessa, and we'll tell you a little bit later on about our show on Friday. Yes, we will have a regular podcast on Friday as well, and we'll tell you who's going to be on that, a bunch of trainers whose names you probably know, but let's talk about some horses that you'll want to get to know, and we will start bright and early on Saturday, uh, just about the crack of noon. Uh, and if you're on the West Coast, much, much earlier than that. 11.50 a.m. Eastern for the first of the Breeders' Cup races, and that is the Philly and Mare Sprint. It goes seven furlongs. Thirteen fillies and mares are in this race, led on the morning line by Goodnight Olive, the number eight horse for Chad Brown. Irad Ortiz will be riding. She's on a five-race winning streak, most recently scoring in the grade one ballerina handicap at Saratoga back on August 28th. So she's had something of a break. Three to one on the line, Jeff Bessa, yes or no on Goodnight Olive. Goodnight Olive is the now horse and uh, deserves to be, but it's a no for me. Um, the race is loaded with speed, okay? Uh, we're going to talk about the sprint later. You get the exact opposite there. But this race is loaded with speed. There's four confirmed front runners, and several others will be wanting to press the pace. And they're going to be coming into this race thinking that there's this great speed bias at Keeneland. And I think we're going to see a very hot pace going seven furlongs, and it's going to set it up for a closer. And there's a few closers you could look at, but my top selection is Chain of Love. Uh, the Japanese horses have been performing extremely well. Uh, in Dubai, and of course, last year in the Breeders' Cup, they won a couple races. Um, this is the only Japanese horse, I think, the right. entire Breeders' Cup weekend. This horse raced in the Golden Shaheen, which is a very hard sprint, 13 horses, uh, was flying late down the outside, took fourth, beaten only two lengths, was only a head back to Dr. Scheibel, um, and been racing against the boys in Japan, racing very competitively on the dirt. His last six, her last six races now switches to the mares, gets the hot pace, the closing style. I really like this horse at 20 to one. Hope I get close to that. That's my top selection. Who do you like, Ed? I have to say, and I mean this with no derision because I picked his the bomb in the derby. This, this is the most shocked I've ever been by a pick. Oh, yeah, uh, all chain right. Of love. All right. Discuss. But, <laughs> no, I, I love it. I mean, taking a shot at a big price, he has reasons for it, as I did with Tis the Bomb. She's not for me, but I mean, he's the first person I've heard pick her. And, and when you get to that kind of separation, you can really be onto something. So I applaud it. Uh, I don't agree, but that's one of those I would never talk someone off a price like that. So uh, love to hear it. I'm the exact opposite, though. This is one of my stronger opinions for a chalk on the Breeders' Cup, and in fact, is the first favorite I am picking so far. But good night, Olive. I love the progression. Chad Brown is not afraid to put horses in the stakes off a of maiden win or an N1X. He has brought good night, Olive, along to this spot, and I expect a huge performance from her. Uh, she is one of my more likely favorites of the Breeders' Cup program, and I'm going to single her in the early pick five. All right. Sarah, do you want to, uh, you know, weigh in on Jeff's pick before you make yours? <laughs> I mean, think about this. If the Japanese are sending over only one horse, is it really going to be one that doesn't have a chance? 
I don't know. I mean, I didn't pick her on top, but I wouldn't talk anybody off of her. And I would consider using her somewhere because she is going to get that hot pace to close in to. And ever since they switched her from the turf to the dirt, she's hit the board in all of her starts, except for that one where she was closing fast to finish fourth. So I don't, I don't hate it. I'm here for it. Um, but I'm going right to the inside with Frank's Rockette, the number five horse who's six to one on the morning line there was a time in 2020 where she was stringing wins together um, on quite the hot streak so much so that they tried her in the breeders cup sprint against males which was won by whitmore that that year i think since then maybe she fell off the map a little bit but lately she's been very good and been running figures that are the fastest that we've seen from her in her career all of those seconds adding up kind of became a huge red flag But you could see two starts ago when she was second to Kamari, there was a legitimate excuse there. She stumbled very badly at the break, had to come from far off of it, and the Kamari just ran her down late, who was going to be taking on the boys in the Breeders' Cup sprint. I know that Charlestown isn't exactly the classiest place to come in with your last race before the Breeders' Cup, but I think that if she's she's hitting those 100 buyers now with consistency, she's a a real player in here, and she's going to get the setup. Okay. Charlestown has had more winners than Kentucky Downs. So for in, uh, in the breeders cup. Yeah. I, I did not, I did not know that. Mm, It's wild and crazy stuff. Well, wild and crazy stuff. Okay. So, uh, uh, Jeff, do you want to have a last word about, you know, your, your pick has sort of become it's trending here just in the last few moments. I mean, uh, not really because I hope I get that 20 to one. (laughs) Okay. Uh, (laughs) You know, and you'll get it. Um, You know, and I don't want to give it too much away. I have posted my Breeders' Cup package is $20 Mm -hmm. and you're going to get my analysis on every single horse that's got a chance to win. Okay. All right. Including, by the way, Goodnight Olive and and Frank's Rockette. Uh, And you're going to get my analysis, of course, on this horse. Okay. I just mentioned. So I I like Chain to Love and I'm going to stick with that. I think um, 20 to 1, there's no way that horse. Uh, should be 20 to one. And uh, to me, it's a top value pick. I will say this. I haven't talked to Kate Hunter yet. Who's the liaison uh, for Japan racing when its horses come over here. I suspect one big reason that we didn't have the contingent from Japan that was at Del Mar last year. And of course, delivered two wins first two that Japan ever had in all the times it's tried in the Breeders' Cup uh, is because Keeneland's a little farther from Japan than Del Mar and a little more unpredictable in terms of weather. And if you're going to make the investment, you kind of want to be a little more uh, in terms of sure footing, uh, knowing where you're going to be going. So I think that might be part of it. And as far as my Philly and Mare sprint uh, choice, I'm going to go with Echo Zulu, six to one for Steve Asmussen, Ricardo Santana Jr. Five for five on fast going and won the uh, 2021 uh, juvenile Phillies. So uh, that's why I'm looking in that direction of the Philly and Mare sprint. All right, we've belabored that race a lot. Let's go pick up the pace with the turf sprint, 1229 Eastern. They'll go five and a half furlongs, 14 plus two also eligibles. Golden Pal trying to go out with the big valedictory. We'll hear from Wesley Ward on Friday's podcast. Eight for eight on U.S. turf, two to one morning line. The number two horse is the favorite. Ed, we'll start with you. I'm going to try to beat Golden Pal. I, I just think the price is going to be too short. So kind of similar vibe to Cave Rock um, in that regard. Obviously, he can win. And we might know, you know, four jumps out of the gate that anyone who tried to oppose him is a loser. I'm liking what I'm hearing. And, and Ron, you can correct me if I'm maybe not hearing correctly because you're there. But it seems like the European contingent is high on Highfield Princess. And yes. having done this, uh, this will be... 21 breeders cups as a professional you kind of get a vibe for you know how different people ship in and you know whether they're full of hot air or not and the the europeans i think are pretty honest and part of that is because they have wagering on this for a month now if not longer uh so they have a sense of the market and highfield princess fits this group they came in here and they won with glass slippers two years ago and i think she fits and you're actually going to get a decent price on a Philly that if Golden Pal weren't, uh, or Mayor, excuse me, if Golden Pal weren't in here, would probably be favored. So uh, it's a little bit of a gamble to try to beat the monster from Wesley, but I think I'm going to try to do it with Highfield Princess. Yeah, she's won three group ones in a row uh, in France, in England, and in Ireland most recently. 
uh, in the flying five. So yeah, you certainly make a case. And if you look at international markets, she certainly uh, was getting a lot of money in those. Sarah? I feel like everybody, uh, every time Golden Pal races, it's the, I'm going to try to beat Golden Pal. And for me personally, it's only been one time and one time was enough. Um, I'm not trying to beat Golden Pal. Um, but I will say, if you want a bomb to come in third, possibly, I'm a little intrigued by Casadero, the number 13 horse, who very recently switched to the turf and finished third with a terrible trip in his first turf try at Saratoga. He then went to the Woodbine at Neartic Stakes at a grade two, and he won that race at eight to one over some some pretty decent horses in that spot. He earned a 101 buyer for that effort. And at 20 to one with Flavian Pratt aboard on the turf, I think you could do a lot worse. Mm. Even if you like Golden Powell and Highfield Princess, this guy's going to come running late and could get a little piece. All right, Jeff, how about you? I'm going to the rail, creative force. Um, I get Appleby Bulick and 10 to one. Of course, has been running in grade one competition nonstop. has got grade one wins um, and took a little break after July. Has one race coming in here. Uh, ran well, by the way. And uh, this horse, I think, is going to get a perfect trip down there on the rail. I think the horse has some tactical speed. Shouldn't lose, Shouldn't get shuffled back. I love inside horses uh, sprinting on the grass. And uh, this horse at 10 to 1 is a top value horse for me. It's And it's interesting, too, when you look at this, because you don't have a lot of horses that are coming in off British Champions Day. Uh, although... Now, the way the calendar works, you get the extra week instead of being a two week turnaround. Now it's just three. So or it's actually uh, stretched out to three. And I'm looking at one. Um, you talk about the other horse. I'm looking at the other Saddler. Uh, yeah, we, we're going to talk about flight line later, but I'm looking at Bran in this race. Vincent Chemino will be up Won the uh, turf sprint at Kentucky Downs grade two. Uh, yeah, I get it, Ed. Uh, Kentucky Downs may not be the bellwether for the Breeders' Cup, but I'm also looking at a joint best last Brisnet speed rating in terms of this field. I'm not going to ignore that. While I, I know that the turf route races here have been favoring closers, turf sprints, I think you might have a better shot here with a horse like Bran at 15 to 1. Let's get to the dirt mile. And uh, this one, I, I you know, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to start with you in a moment here, Ed. If you didn't read Ed's fair odds, uh, and you can still do that at Horse Racing Nation. We're teeing those up again. But he has an interesting optic about the dirt mile. All the run-ups for these races are 10 yards in terms of when the clock starts coming out of the gate, except for the dirt mile. It's 70. They're going to go 210 feet. It's because of the configuration of the track. It's the whole reason for doing this. Cody's Wish at 5-2 to two for Bill Mott with Junior Alvarado riding has won three in a row in six of the last seven, including the four-go at Saratoga, uh, despite being headstrong at the gate. 5-2 uh, to two for the number seven horse, Cody's Wish. A lot of buzz about this particular entry. But, Ed, tell us about why you've got to be very careful, especially if you're on the uh, outside looking in at the dirt mile. Yeah, the, uh, the dirt mile is not kind to the outside post positions. And when I ran the numbers for HRN's Breeders' Cup coverage, I looked at fields of 10 or more because I wanted to you know try to come up with a number that sort of encapsulated what we're actually going to have on Breeders' Cup Day. And it was posts seven and beyond uh, were one for 90-something. I'm drawing mm. a blank on, on the singles digit there, but one for 90-something whether it's one for 90 or one for 99 is, is pretty much equally bad at that point. Yeah. So this was an automatic, uh, when they drew this race, eight, nine, where they got 11, eight, nine, 10 and 11, I completely eliminated from consideration, uh, which is a shame because I thought Senor Buscador maybe have had a look uh, with a better draw. Uh, Cyber knife, I didn't really like anyway. So it's kind of nice to have him eliminated uh, at a short-ish price. Uh, Cody's wish is on the cusp in post seven. Yep. He's fast enough where I'm going to be a little more forgiving since he's not on the far outside. Um, and, and I'll let uh, Sarah take it from here when we get to her. Uh, but I have seen the video she did with Jason Beam. And I don't think her and I have ever agreed as much on a race as we do on this one. Uh, it comes down to pipeline. 
uh, Laurel River, Good Night, and Cody's Wish for Me, and Pipeline at eight to one, whereas the others are shorter, sticks out big. And if we get that price, that's absolutely my pick. All right, Sarah, I'll let you pick up the gauntlet. Well, Pipeline has a lot of weight to carry now, but <laughs> with a horse like this, you're looking at one that has kind of been fairly lightly handled as far as stakes company within his nine race career. But if you go back a ways all the way to September of 2021, he actually did beat Cody's wish two times um, when he broke his maiden. And then in the race before that, when they both finished behind vindictive, obviously both of them are better horses now, but just a little fun fact to keep in mind this year, he debuted um, for his, First start of his four-year-old season in the allowance race with a 104 buyer, and that was going the mile distance. He's also gone a mile and an eighth in the Monmouth Cup, finishing second. And last time out in the forego, to look a horse like Jackie's Warrior in the eye early, I think it very quickly out of the gate, you see Joel look over and be like, wait a minute, somebody is right there next to me, and kind of ask Jackie to go a little bit. And if you like Jackie later, I feel like you have to like pipeline a little bit in here, not having that pace presence alongside with him in a horse like Jackie's warrior. So I like pipeline because he has the early speed. I think that he can handle this distance while others may not, because like Ed said, this is really technically a mile and 70 yards. It is that. And it, which, by the way, uh, trivia note, the first three runnings of the dirt mile were neither dirt nor mile. The first one at uh, Monmouth in 2007 was a mile and 70 yards and slop. And then the next two at Santa Anita were back in the days when they had the pro ride uh, fake dirt there. So it wasn't until the fourth year at Churchill that the dirt mile became a dirt mile. And if you were looking for two turns in that race, you had to wait until the, I think it was the sixth year. Anyway, Jeff, that was from the movie. Who cares? I'll let you pick it up here. All right. I'm, I'm going a different direction. I don't have a problem with pipeline as, as their pick, but um, first of all, I feel like the majority of horses in this race are one turn horses. There's actually very few in here that are two, uh, actually two turn horses. And uh, so I'm going to go a different route. I'm going slow down Andy on the rail, 30 to one uh, horse has speed, gets the perfect rail draw. There's going to be a little shuffle between the one, two, and three going into that first turn. I'd rather be on the rail to get that trip. And uh, this horse is 30 to one, two turns is perfect. And, you know, I'm taking a shot. I don't have, you know, much else to say. The horse just is coming out of the awesome again, you know, lost to defunded and country grammar, took third in there by two lengths. That's an impressive effort. Won a turf race, uh, has been doing good all year. And I think this is the kind of horse that could steal it. Mario Gutierrez will be riding as usual for Doug O'Neill on Slowdown Andy, who's by Nyquist, the uh, Kentucky Derby winner from a go. Uh, I'm looking at Laurel River. I'm trying. I, I did that cutoff ad at, at post seven and out. <laughs> so I went six and in. I'm right there on the edge. Six Laurel River, nine to two for Bob Baffert. Uh, Irad Ortiz will ride three wins by a combined 19 and a half lengths, including the Pat O'Brien, the grade two at Del Mar. And that's the direction I'm going in the dirt mile back to the turf the philly and mare turf a mile and three sixteenths at 150 eastern time saturday 12 of the disc staff are entered in this turf race number three nashua at five to two on the morning line i don't know that it's going to be as short as five to two i think the race might be a little more wide open than that john and fady gosden are the trainers of record with holly doyle the rider this is a winner of two group ones in europe and was second in the Prix de l'Opera on very soft going, which it seems to be eternally now on Arc Day in Paris. Let's start with you, Jeff, on the Philly and Mare turf. The Prix de l'Opera is an absolutely key prep. And uh, I think we get three horses coming out of that race. I wouldn't fault anyone for going in any direction. I'm, I'm struggling picking between two horses, but I like the three and the four, Nashua and above the curve. Uh, above the curve was actually getting to Nashua a little bit in the Prix de l'Opera. They finished only, uh, you know, a head apart. Um, but I think that's, it's going to be a fairly chalky race. And one of those two takes it home. Ed? This is my best bet of the weekend. I love Moira. Uh, I thought her Queen's plate was spectacular. Things didn't go well in the EP Taylor. 
uh, I was actually shocked watching the race live that um, she even managed to be second. Now she was deservedly disqualified after that reckless move by her rider, uh, but that she even <laughs> did that uh, showed some fight. So that's a positive, I suppose. This is a total bet that she can run back to the Queen's Plate and run back to that race on turf. But we get the form darkener. We get Frankie DeTore, right? and we get 10 to 1. Uh, and I, I like the outside post for her because she just needs to stay out of trouble to have that big uh, move. And she's had some triple-digit pace ratings from Brisnet. So uh, I'm a believer. I love that we're getting a price finally. She's my best bet of the weekend. Uh, I am absolutely using her every which way possible in this race. And uh, if she wins, I'll be really excited. Moira, the last winner of a race that will be known as the Queen's Plate, at least that race uh, to be known as such in our lifetimes, probably since the current and next monarch of uh, Britain uh, are male. So they changed the race back to uh, King's. And the next one Plate. after that. That's Yeah, that's what I said, next two. That's where you heard oh, it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, unless, you know, unless you got other plans for them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not, nothing Just, I'm willing to put on the record. No, well, Wallace Warfield Simpson on line one. Uh, Sarah? Um, a horse that I feel confident will not have any traffic trouble is in Italian because I think she's going to be in front. Um, we saw at Saratoga in the Diana just an absolutely freakish performance from her with those fast fractions early and then to keep on going late. Um, that was an incredible performance. And I think maybe some question as to whether she would back that up. And she did next time out in the first lady at Keeneland going a mile. I know the distance might be a little bit of a question for her, but I think when you ride a speed horse in the way that Joel Rosario has been riding her with actually letting her use her speed early, instead of trying to ration and snatching and grabbing, like we see so often on the New York turf races, that it's very dangerous. And she's sort of found this weapon of hers that I think uh, could be very dangerous in a spot like this with a lot of horses needing to come from off the pace and get a good trip. I'm going to fly in the face of what Jeff mentioned, what I've actually seen here at Keeneland this fall. Uh, and that is going with a speed horse in this race. I like in Italian, partly because I've let in Italian beat me a couple of times when I probably shouldn't have Chad Brown, Joel Rosario in this one. I mean, if, if she's going to win, she's probably going to wire it. Uh, Dubawi, a four-year-old. Uh, but uh, this is a horse that's uh, won a couple of grade ones most recently with the Diana and the First Lady. So uh, I'll cast my fate to the wind there. And uh, hopefully, Jeff, get the word out that uh, speed horses don't do well on the turf. I want longer uh, than seven to two on this. Hey, can I uh, just say one other thing? So Sarah and I are going to be doing a video on this race. I'll be going into a lot more detail, obviously, with her. But maybe your listeners won't you know, see that video. But I encourage you to watch it. Uh, well, wait a minute. Well, let's find. Let's tell them where to find it, Sarah. Where will they find it? I'm when, when Well, it's everyone up. will subscribe to the Horse Racing Nation YouTube channel because mm -hmm. Jeff is one of 13 others that I have doing um, these guest handicapping videos with for all of the Breeders' Cup races. There you go. Okay, yeah. Jeff. All right. One so, final, so, so two final comments. First of yeah, all, yeah, sure. First of all, Moira got the plus on my chart, which is obviously extremely significant. Um, and the, <laughs> the, issue, from Ed. <laughs> the issue I have with Moira is this is the first time without lay six. I really don't like that angle. Um, and, uh, you know, the outside draw also is a little bit concerned for me, but I think that 12 is a, a great value at 10 to one. Um, and then in Italian, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I mean, I'm just going to say, I don't think this horse wants a mile and three sixteenths and, uh, okay. So I think you guys are, unfortunately, she's going to tire. And, and, by way, like... and by the way, Nashua has great speed. Nashua yeah. will be sitting not that far off of uh, um, in Italian. So if they do slow it down and the horse fa uh, favors, and the race favors a horse that's close up front, Nashua is going to outkick Italian down the lane. You know, I had that lunch I owe you from a, like a million years ago. It sounds like the money I was going to spend on that, I'm going to be wasting on an Italian in the affiliate mare turf while you're wasting it on Moira. <laughs> is, is that where we're going with this? Well, if an Italian wins, I'll know, I'll know you have the funds to, to pay up. <laughs> yeah. I, I still will love it to dinner, though, so I can't talk. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. And by the way, David was on last week's pod to, if you missed that, to give us early, an early look. 
uh, at the Breeders' Cup. So you know, I'm, I'm, we're plugging everything here, past, present, and future. Uh, the immediate future on this podcast is to talk about the Breeders' Cup Sprint, 2.30 Eastern Time. And this one will feature 11 horses going six furlongs. Jackie's Warrior. Here we go. With Jack Christopher now out of the race, Chad Brown said, uh, told the Daily Racing Forum, he didn't think that he would pass a vet check based on his uh, odd gait, and he didn't want to take any chances that that was going to be blotting his record. So he's out. Jackie's Warrior now a four to five morning line favorite. It certainly wouldn't have been that price if Jack Christopher had been in. Uh, these 11 horses going six furlongs highlighted by uh, Steve Asmussen and Joel Rosario, the connections for Jackie's Warrior, seven wins in the last nine, the 2021 male sprint champion. The only losses in those nine were in last year's Breeders' Cup sprint to Aloha West, who's back, and in the uh, last race that he ran, the forego at Saratoga, which also tells you it's been a little while since we have seen him. Ed, what do you think about the sprint? Uh, I'm glad that Wesley Ward put Kamari here instead of against females. Uh, she's undefeated at six furlongs, has a couple wins at Keeneland. And I think uh, kind of similar to the vibe from the juvenile, certainly Jackie's Warrior at four to five, same morning line price as Cave Rock, is among the likely winners, probably the most likely. Uh, but Kamari, uh, the price is just too good. Uh, you get a few pounds with the sex allowance, and she has numbers that are right there and Jackie's warrior has questions based on what we saw last out and in the breeders cup last year that I got to try to take a shot again. So that's on and I'm going to try to do it with Mari. Sarah, your thoughts on the sprint. I think such a big defection with Jack Christopher coming out because now Jackie's warrior, if he loses, it's going to be because of him only. He's the only one that can lose this race for him. He should be kind of the lone speed in a spot like this. He's going a furlong shorter than he was last time when he suffered defeat in the four go. And that was with a pace presence like Pipeline pressing him around the track early. I just don't really see who's going to put that pressure on him to set it up for all of these horses that want to come from off the pace. He draws favorably to the outside in this spot. I'm not going to try to beat him. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, Jackie's Warrior. Uh, this race, first of all, has no speed in it. The only pace pressure might come from this 11 uh, on the outside, who's completely outclassed by Jackie's Warrior. Um, and this Jackie's Warrior can go a mile. So the horse will finish plenty strong, and there's going to be no one in front of her. Uh, him, sorry. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think Jackie's Warrior wins. If you're looking for a horse underneath, um to set something up a little bit better aloha west at 12 to 1 is a very good price i wouldn't fault anybody for betting the defending champion who's coming into the race in similar fashion to last year so uh that's where you can find some value underneath is with aloha west it was odd uh, last week wayne catalano seemed to be talking up manny wa the other catalano in this race other than aloha west but you know okay trainer speak we can take that for what it may be worth on a given day uh if the speed were to break down not that there's anything not that there's much of it there just with jackie's warrior and then you know whoever uh, elite power to me could look like a horse to pick up the pieces. Mott and Irod, four wins in a row, including the Vosberg at uh, the Belmont of Big A meet. A uh, closer, though, albeit a closer, but we'd have to see tra trends changing. But, you know, you can go to school on the track Friday and then early Saturday. And if you start to see maybe that uh, off the pace can deliver here, not just off the pace, but way off the pace, then maybe you look at somebody like Elite Power. Now we look at the miles. We return to the grass at 310 Eastern time, a full field of 14, plus a couple of also eligibles. This is a modern game's chance to get a second consecutive Breeders' Cup win. We mentioned his controversial win in last year's juvenile turf at Del Mar, now coming back for Charlie Appleby with William Buick up. Two for two in U.S. races, the other victory, or I should say North American races. I didn't just invade Canada and take it over, but he did win the Woodbine Mile. Also was second recently, just three weeks ago, at the QE2, going this distance on a straight at Ascot. Uh, you're looking at seven to two on the morning line for Modern Games. Sarah, are you looking at Modern Games, or are you looking somewhere else? 
Well, I think that you have to look at modern games at least a little bit and respect what he's accomplished. Even if you have a sour taste in your mouth about the wagering from last year, the horse is very talented and a deserving favorite in a spot like this. <clears throat> I know the post draw certainly doesn't help him, but I'm going to give a look to the 14 domestic spending. Chad doesn't do this really often. He he doesn't have the kind of confidence that he's showing in a horse like this to come from such a long layoff and throw them right into a grade one, let alone the Breeders' Cup dirt uh, mile, not dirt, just turf. Um, mm -hmm. But he, I feel as though he has, when he's talked about this horse, you can kind of just tell that he thinks he's sitting on a very big effort. And even with the loss last time, that was a completely paceless race. I think that there's enough speed in here that Pratt can just tuck in, save ground, and come with a late closing run in a spot like this. Yeah, by the way, uh, there was a bit of controversy, and Cheryl Spite was appearing to be on the outside looking in, having actually won uh, a big race here at Keeneland. But domestic spending, uh, you were looking at the layoff of uh, more than a year. It has been so long. Uh, that the last time that he raced was at Arlington Park. You know, it was that long ago when he won the Mr. D. But uh, because... Second in the Mr. D. Uh, uh, what's that? Second in the Mr. D. Pardon me. Thank you. Second in the Mr. D finishing uh, by a neck of uh, second as the favorite in that race. Thank you, Ed. Um, and uh, so it's been that long. But uh, they both got in. And so you're looking at uh, eight to one there, as mentioned uh, for this horse that hasn't raced since August 14th, 2021. Jeff? Modern Games uh, makes a lot of sense, and I wouldn't fault anybody that wants to single Modern Games. <clears throat> but I'll give, give a different horse out. That I think uh, merits a really strong look, and that's Dream Loper, who comes out. This is a mare. Mares, by the way, win this race. We all remember Goldakova. Many uh, Phillies and Mares have won this race, especially the Europeans. Uh, and this horse comes out of the Prix de Milan, which is a very key European mob prep. Blew the field away by five lengths. Okay, that's against the boys. Several other uh, impressive grade one efforts can win on good or soft ground. And so if you're trying to beat modern games, maybe take this little fresher mare, Dream Loper. Yeah, that, that's a good one to look at, Ed. If you like a horse, but you start to get turned off by the connections, you may not know Ed Walker, the trainer, or Kieran Schumark, the jockey, but uh, you start to look at the record. It's the old thing. You, you do the eye test and don't look at the names and things like that uh, in, in terms of Dream Loper. What about you? This is a, a race where I'm excited to wager, not because necessarily who I like to win, but I, I think Ivar uh, is going to offer value regardless of how you wager on him. Uh, 15 to 1 on the line. He runs his race each time. It definitely was not good enough to beat modern games at Woodbine. Clearly, second best there. Was not good enough to get to Annapolis. Maybe a little more trouble in that race than he had at Woodbine. Second again. A lot of those types of races on his page. Uh, but at that price, uh, if I can get him in there with Dream Loper, who I definitely think fits Regal Glory uh, or the favorite modern games, uh, I still think you can do okay in the big field. So it's not so much for me, my excitement with this race about, oh, Ivar is going to win. Although if he does, I'm hopefully we'll still be okay with that. But definitely want to get him in the mix with the logicals. And uh, I'm looking forward to the mile from a wagering perspective because of Ivar uh, as an exotics contender. But I am picking him to win, but I'm playing the race. He just needs to be in the mix. Okay. I'm looking at Regal Glory if I'm looking at something other than uh, modern games, because I really do like modern games here. But Regal Glory, three grade one wins since last fall, was second uh, then in the four-star Dave. And uh, the first lady also, uh, those winners of those races are not here. Uh, so that's what you're looking at in terms of a possible other at least on the ticket I may be playing. So that's the mile that will be taking place here on the turf at Keeneland. The distaff back on the main track. It's a mile and an eighth, and eight are in for the 355 race for Phillies and Mares. And this is the story of Neston Malathat. Yep. And we're going to have Todd Pletcher on the pod on Friday to talk about them. Uh, Todd's got them both. Of course, Nest, the great three-year-old right now, uh, three wins by a combined 26 lengths in her current streak, including a couple of grade ones. 
also won the uh, grade two bell dame at aqueduct last out malathot the four-year-old with uh, johnny velasquez up erod by the way riding nest jv on malathot two wins uh, the most recent pair being in grade ones, the personal ensign and the spinster. The last three times going with blinkers seems to have made quite a difference with two wins in a close second. So in the disc staff, you've got the nine to five nest. You've got the three to one Malafat. You've got Jeff trying to distill the disc staff. This is a really good race. And I plan, first of all, just a great race to watch. Uh, you know, this will decide the champion uh, female horse of the year. I am going to be playing doubles probably into and out of this race because I feel like I have such a, a, a strong opinion with value here. And um, so I'll tell you how I like it. But my top horse I'm playing is Society. This horse is a young gun runner that is getting right at the exact right time. I'm willing to forgive that CCA Oaks because she had such a rough trip, not only broke slow and got bumped, uh, but then was rank when Ness crossed in front of her. She then exploded through on the rail very aggressively and used herself up and tired badly. That was only her fourth lifetime start compared to Ness, who was eight. You'll recall, Ron, I gave Society out on your podcast. Mm -hmm. She won at yep. eight to one. And I hit a $120 daily double in, into her. Um, so Society, to me, makes a lot of sense and you're going to get a great price while everyone's on nest and mouth that the other way I see the race possibly unfolding is if nest goes too quickly with society. Okay. Now I don't think it'll happen, but if nest does go too quickly with society and they do force a fast pace, then I like Clary air coming from behind. And you're uh, going to get a great price on Clary air who threw this conquer in, in the personal ensign that was completely, you know, not her race. And you can make a very strong argument. She's actually the best older mare in the country. And you're going to get her maybe third price. Third, she'll be third place on the odds. So I think I got great odds on both those Asmussen horses into and out of the double uh, for this race. That's how I'm looking at it. Ed? This is my uh, biggest morning line price on top. I like Blue Stripe. Uh, and it's a tough race at the end of the day to really – for me, because I have kind of two dueling opinions, one on the opposite end of 20 to one is I am against Nest. I think she's an underlay, unlike Cave Rock and Golden Pal. I'm not going to say I don't think she can win. Obviously, she can win. I don't know that she's even the most likely winner, though, and she'll certainly be bet that way. So that's one opinion I'd want to take advantage of if she loses. I don't necessarily want to be so bullish on Blue Stripe that I'm ripping up tickets if society or search results wins. The other two I also like, but at 20 to one, a big price in the distaff, and maybe it's PTSD from the big price in last year's distaff. Uh, but this just feels like a race that can blow up again. And her Santa Margarita at this distance was absolutely fine. The Hirsch was even better. Layoff, mild concern. Connections aren't known for Breeders' Cup by any means, but you're getting a big, big price to find out. Yeah, you're talking about trainer Marcelo Polanco and jockey Hector Barrios. So that's uh, number two blue stripe at 20 to one on the morning line. Sarah? You know, there's a lot of society love out there. And I think yeah, a lot of people, I know not Jeff, one of them, but I think a lot of people envision her as being lone speed. But I think that if you look right to the inside, search results is not going to let her get too far ahead early. Remember, this is the horse that went toe-to-toe -to -toe quickly early on with Latruska, who, for what uh, has kind of deflated in her career this year, she is still fast in the first couple of uh, jumps out of the gate there. I think if Clarier had won the personal ensign, we'd be looking at the favorite for this race, but one bad effort and suddenly, you know, excuse or not, everybody's like, ah, whatever, we're on to the next great thing. But I'm very interested in Clarier, I can make some excuses for that poor effort last time. And I think if we see what we saw from her earlier this year, she's already beat a lot of these horses before, and she's going to be the better price. I love Clarier here. I actually think there is enough space, uh, speed for her to chase four to one morning line. I think it could be longer than that. If all the money comes pounding in on nest and Malathat. I uh, was in a group of uh, reporters with Steve Asmussen earlier this week. I think it was Dave Grenning from the forum who brought up the gate issues that uh, Clarier had loading for the personal incident. I mean, it was like she was beside herself. And he used some 
sort of euphemism and Steve looks at Dave, uh, Steve Asmussen looks at Dave and says, you're trying to be politically correct there to spare her feelings or mine. And, it was, and he did say, because Steve said, they do take pride in having horses not doing that, that if you look at an Asmus trained horse, they're not going to be fractious and headstrong at the gate. So if you want to talk about drawing a line through a race, draw a line through the load for that race in terms uh, of that. And that's what I'm looking at in terms of Clarier. And I put a lot of money on Clarier over the last couple of years. Uh, and it seems like every time I do, I lose. And every time I don't, she wins. So take that with the grain of salt, roughly the size of the Bonneville Flats in Utah. At 4.40 Eastern time, the feature on the grass, and that is the mile and a half turf, three turns. And this is the question of which Applebee do you like if you're looking at what the masses may do and what the futures betting showed in internationally. Rebels Romance is the three to one morning line favorite. James Doyle will get the ride looking for a fifth consecutive win. Rebels Romance is. Uh, but a couple of those were Germany group one. So way into that, what you will. Nation's Pride to me should be the favorite, but okay, that's me. Seven to two for Appleby with William Buick up. And right there, that should tell you something. And Buick's got that ride. Uh, you're talking about a horse that's been over here a while in the turf triple in New York. Two wins and a close second. The wins uh, coming in the uh, Saratoga Derby and then most recently second in the Jockey Club Derby. Uh, so those are the two that may be catching a lot of money. Uh, 13 horses are going to be starting in this 440 Eastern time race. Ed, what do you think of the turf? For the second time on the Saturday card, I'm taking the uh, female against the males. I thought Warlike Goddess... Uh, showed up last out in the Hirsch and loved the fact that she was a little closer um, is necessitated uh, by the style of racing in New York. Uh, Keeneland might be a little different with the Euros, but uh, she's susceptible to rider tactics. There's some questions, uh, but at nine to two, I think we're getting compensated for knowing that she is uh, a mare that can get into some trouble, but if she's able to get the right trip, uh, I absolutely think she's the most likely winner of this group. That if is why we're getting nine to two instead of two to one. Uh, but I'm going to take it. I thought that last race absolutely wins this race. So she has to ride it, run it right back. Uh, and I'll bet that she does. Sarah. Yeah, I'm with Ed. I mean, I hope there's been a conversation or at least uh, Joel Rosario took a look at the replay last time. To... <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, a great writer, but that was, um, I've heard kind words like questionable and overconfident be used to describe what happened uh, to back at Saratoga. And I'll leave it at that. But last time, sat a little bit closer to the pace set by Bye Bye Melvin, who's back in here and just really overpowered that field. And if you're a buyer's person, which I am, um, Nation's Pride doesn't really stack up with a lot of these other horses that uh, mm. Warlike Goddess included, but many others too that are much bigger prices. And I get that, you know, the, the connections and he's been here and the European pedigree and all that, but I'm not really interested in him at all. Um, you do have Warlike Goddess and the Rebels Romance as well, who are both undefeated at this mile and a half distance. And one of them's going to uh, keep that record intact, I believe. All right, Jeff. So, you know, traditionally the Europeans win this race is very rare otherwise. Uh, the only American horse I would consider is Warlike Goddess. Um, but I'm going to go a different route. I feel like it's it's the Euros again, but the Euros coming over this year are a little stranger than normal. There's not, to me, a great standout Euro. Uh, so I want a price. And I'm going to go, there's a couple I could look at, but my top selection is going to be Broom at 12 to 1. Adrian O'Brien, I rad Ortiz. I rad rode this horse last year almost won the race. Okay. I got beat late by you beer. I was all over this horse a year ago. Recent, obviously the form looks bad the last two races, but that was the typical bog at long shop. And I just don't think this horse likes that. Right. Agreed. And, um, this horse is running well on good tracks, uh, had some trouble in Saratoga. People are going to see that loss to Gufo. Uh, but I think this horse, um, maybe he won't get it quite as firm as, as he wants, but you get a good draw on the four hole. You get Irad back up. He's going to want to, uh, get a win here and I'm going broom 12 to one. 
Yeah, and, and if you go back, I mean, the, the race of Saratoga and the Sword Dancer uh, did not do well at the start, but was coming late. Uh, if you look at Leopardstown and the Irish champion, uh, that, again, was coming late, but a shorter race. And then you mentioned uh, the, the quicksand that they were in, as they annually are now on, in the arc. So, uh, yeah, I'm with you in looking at Broom. I'm also looking at Warlike Goddess. And I think, if anything, if there's going to be a spread race for me, uh, in terms of late exotics uh, horizontally, it would be the turf. Probably not going to be the classic. Uh, this is going to be a challenging one to discuss uh, unless uh, anyone is bold enough to try to go against Flightline in the 540 feature on Saturday. A mile and a quarter. There are eight in the race. Flightline, three to five on the morning line. Let's see how short he goes. American Pharaoh is sort of the guidepost from here seven years ago as to how short will a horse go racing for $6 million here in the United States. John Sadler looking for his second win in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Flavian Pratt is riding. This is a five for five horse. A uh, historically high buyer speed figure of 126 in that Pacific Classic win that I witnessed. 19 and a quarter lengths was the margin. All right, um, we'll tee this up, Sarah. I, whichever way you want to go, I mean, you want to go ahead and talk about uh, how you're going to beat Flightline, how you're going to try to make money with Flightline. What's your what's your angle on this race? I'm not going to try to beat flight line, but I will give you a straight exacta that I hope can add a little bit of value because I do really like happy saver in second. And I think he's going to be completely forgotten. Oh, wow. Um, he's the longest shot in this field at 30 to one. He's finished second to flight line before. And if you watch all of flight lines races, he is the one that gets the closest to him in the stretch. I don't think he was ever winning that race by any stretch of the imagination, but to come that close to the horse that, is three to five, four to five, and you're 30 to one when everybody else is a shorter price. I think that that discrepancy is definitely worth a look. And then in the Whitney, I mean, life is good was uh, always clear in there, but happy saver took a little bit of a run at him too. Yep. And then last time in the Lucas classic with all the drama and the controversy, and I know that you're well familiar with all of that run and all Just of your stories and, yeah. <laughs> and we're all kind of over it now, but Happy Saver was bothered too. I mean, Rich Strike was coming to his outside and you can see an elbow thrown over at Happy Saver and he, he gets bumped around and blocked in for making a clear run in there. So if I toss that race, I'm looking at a horse that has a second to flight line, a second to life is good and a second before that to Olympiad and he's 30 to one. I definitely want to use this horse in second for a straight four, three, and that's going to be my attempt to make some money with flight line. Yeah, the closest race that Flightline has had was the sixth length victory over Happy Saver in the Met Mile. Jeff? So a couple of things I want to mention here. First of all, money management. Okay, let's say you're playing a pick five and you can't leave Flightline off your ticket. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got to, if you're going to use another horse, you've got to play the pick five ticket with Flightline four or five times harder. Okay, you cannot just right. spread too deep and use flight line at one to two odds. You're just throwing, basically flight line hurts you. You're giving away equity if flight line wins. So if you're playing pick fives and you're going to use flight line, you either got a single flight line or play flight line heavier. Uh, that's just a money management tip for people. Second thing, uh, you can't bet this horse to win. I'm going to be betting to win uh, Epicenter, okay? I've been on Epicenter all year. I think this horse is extremely impressive. And the way Asmussen is talking about Epicenter right yeah. now just makes me wonder, is this horse actually better than he was in the Travers? Okay, and, and Asmussen's not a big talker, okay? But he is very high on the way Epicenter is coming into this race. The horse is so intelligent. He can run inside. He doesn't care about getting the dirt in his face. He can uh, be near the lead. He can drop back. Um, Rosario Norris, of course, extremely well. The horse is going to make his run. Maybe it's only good enough for second best to flight line, but that's going to be my straight exacta. Flight line over epicenter, and epicenter be how I play it to win. Okay. Ed, how about you? Uh, I will bet flight line to win if he's somehow four to five, uh, for sure would play him to win. We'll see how I feel if he's three to five. Uh, he's 
our pick. So I'll move on to similar to Sarah and Jeff's approach. Uh, I like life is good to complete the exact. Uh, I think uh, I fell into a trap last year where I fell for his uh, regression, if that's what you want to call it, before the Breeders' Cup. He definitely took a step back numbers wise, even though he won his prep at whatever he was that time last year, two to five. Similarly, this year he was one to 10. And, uh, you know, there was some questions about how good he actually looked. Just seems like Todd's prepping his horses this year. We saw it with Ness. We saw it with Malathot. Uh, and I think we saw it with Life is Good. Now, the big difference is Ness and Malathot are huge contenders in their races. And Life is Good has to tackle flight line, which I don't think is going to happen. But I do think he can be second. And I think a lot of betters are seeing it as an all or nothing for life is good. Maybe somehow he steals it. And if he doesn't, he'll be out of gas going a mile and a quarter and be off the board completely. So I'm going to zag away from that zig and think hmm. that he can still be second over the rest. He's the older male. He has the second fastest figures of the group. And it's a straight exacta for me, flight line over life is good. But uh, I would love to be in a situation where somehow uh, we got blue stripe home in the distaff hmm. and that's still going to make for a good pick five good double and or, or, yeah. flight line win and get my single home. Even a double could be, you know, a, a decent uh, price. If you have blue stripe on the front end of that in the, on those sure. two races, uh, I'd love flight. Life is good more if this race were, you know, a furlong shorter. I, I just, I don't know that he gets the mile and a quarter, especially if he's going to be trying to, uh, hunt flight line at least on the lead, and so I'm 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 tossing him. I the two I like to to join on the ticket underneath. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to put three, and I'm going to put flight line on top, and then I'm going to like wheel three into exact or whatever trifecta super. Taba for one. You're talking about uh, a horse if you draw a line through the Kentucky Derby. And by the way, a lot of it's that's the unusual thing to say, but I think he can do that because it was such a pace dependent race. But if you throw that one out, Taba is a head away from being four for four in the other races and was uh, most recently a winner in the Pennsylvania Derby and kind of looked like a green horse early in the year. I don't think that's the case anymore for Bob Baffert and Mike Smith. I like Epicenter for the reasons stated. I do think, and you know, listen, Steve is talking a really good game right now with Epicenter, and I, and I think it could uh, really, it's something, you know, there, there could be some walk to that talk. And I'm going to throw in Rich Strike. I, I, I mean, I just think that this horse is going to hit the board in some way, shape, or form and uh, is improving and, and drawn wide. Well, last time we saw him drawn really, really wide, he won a really, really big race at 80 to 1. So those are the ones I'm going to be adding to this. Okay, so how about some uh, final impressions in terms of maybe a best bet, a best way to play, uh, some Overarching thoughts about the Breeders' Cup after I tell you first, the past performances heard on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran Speed Points, the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more for yourself at brisnet.com. I want to remind you that uh, coming up on Friday, we're going to be hearing our regular episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. Among the guests, Todd Pletcher, Aidan O'Brien, Wesley Ward, and Peter Miller. Now, let's get to our handicappers. I have to cough. <laughs> Jeff Bessa, you go. Okay. Uh, best bet. I, I guess I can't pick Chain of Love after the abuse I got earlier today. But no, I'm no going... abuse. Respect. 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 Okay. Well, oh. I think, it, you know, it's a long shot. Okay. Um, so, best bet. You know, I'm probably going to be playing a very big double race nine race 10 maybe even race eight race nine uh and so i'm going to say my best bet is broom um and uh just i mean i already made my comments on broom i just think 12 to 1 for those connections is superb adrian o'brien or ratertees horse <laughs> likes the firm horse is a great closer and um i'm gonna go I, i'm hoping to hit a huge double asmussen to broom and I might use one other horse, uh, which I will won't mention here. If you're a subscriber, you'll know who There you go. Uh, leave but, leave uh, a little meat on the bone, right? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I like that double going into race 10 with Broom. Okay. We're, again, charting horse value where Jeff is, uh, <clears throat> my goodness. I wonder what I swallowed here. 
that flew in my throat while we were wrapping things up. Your pride? Yo, I could only hope. Uh, no value there. Uh, find Jeff with charting horse value at picks.horseracingnation.com and on Twitter at infocharting.h01. Sarah L. Bodwi at Outrun the Odds on social media. Your thoughts about Breeders' Cup 2022? Yeah, I mean, I think my my flight line happy saver straight exacta is going to be probably the biggest bet for me. I don't know with all the Breeders' Cup races that I'm going to play as many multis as far as pick fives, pick fours. We might try to stick to more uh, the exotics because unfortunately I do think that a lot of these favorites are dangerous and there's only a few that I would be willing to fade completely and they don't add a lot of value to the multis if they win. But if we get somebody underneath at a huge price, that's where you're going to make a little bit of money uh, as far as the Breeders' Cup. I did just see a mention that Happy Saver does have a little quarter crack in his hoof. Todd Fletcher is still hopeful that he's going to make it into the race after getting that patched up, but he did not train today. So I saw that and I was like, oh, no, is he out? But he is not. He is still running as of now. Yeah, good to mention that. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarah, because we are recording. It's 1037 Eastern time on Thursday as I speak now. So anything that has happened since obviously supersedes that, so you'll understand, uh, because that's kind of how things work with podcasts. Fair odds, he's been uh, reporting those, and it's been very popular, I know, at Horse Racing Nation. You find him on Twitter, at EJXD2. You find him here with some his uh, overarching thoughts about the Breeders' Cup, Ed DeRosa. Uh, well... I think I was pretty clear more of being my best bet and I have our horse. I'm really excited to actually bet um, not totally on top like I am with Moira. Uh, otherwise, I would say for me with Goodnight Olive and Flightline, which happens to bookend the Breeders' Cup experience on Friday, being the only two favorites uh, that I picked on top, uh, there's plenty of hopefully opportunity. Uh, and it's not about necessarily having to beat favorites every race. Uh, but for me, I'm really trying to give myself a pep talk, pump myself up to do the work, to plan out the wagers. And, you know, you got to be adaptable to price and all that when the time comes. But, you know, really take the time to say, OK, well, if, if Modern Games wins, I still need to have something if Blue Stripe wins. Like these are tickets I don't want to be ripping up or Dream Loper into Blue Stripe, things like that. I need to be able to cash. So just, you know, planning things out where I'm not chalking out, even though yes, modern games can win. Uh, yes. Jackie's warrior can win, but really trying to mold in some of my stronger opinions about prices like blue stripe, Ivar, et cetera. And then allowing the case where horses I recognize can do well, like Jackie's warrior uh, still don't blow me up. So to me, that's a big approach going into more Saturday, as I said at the top, because uh, I have stronger opinions that day, but, you know, really for horse playing in general. Uh, for horse playing in general, listen to those three and less to me because they have the track record uh, quite clearly, but I'm, you know, I'm throwing mine in for entertainment value and then <laughs> whatever value I find on tickets as we uh, uh, go forward here. Uh, I'm just going to enjoy seeing flight line. We don't know if this is going to be his last race. We have heard that, you know, the, the ownership coast are owners saying, no, don't rule out next year, but they do have a stallion deal already. And so, yeah, money talks, right? So with that in mind, I've seen his last two races in person. So I will have seen, uh, gosh, I, I would see half of his career yeah. if this winds up being it uh, in person. So I'm looking forward to that and just cherishing the opportunity to uh, see him. I, when I walked over to the barn the other day, uh, I was actually looking for Wayne Lucas. He and Sadler are sharing the same barn because everybody's got to be in the same Rice Road barns for the Breeders' Cup. And, and so I was looking for Wayne, and, and Sadler sees me sort of at the other end of the barn. And he goes, Ron, Ron, no lurking, no lurking. And I realized they're in the same barn. I go, oh, no, I was looking for a much older trainer. And so uh, the, the, John's actually in a, it was, is in a pretty good mood this week. Uh, he doesn't have that schneid that was on him uh, before Accelerate finally won a Breeders' Cup race for him when he was snapped at, what was it, 0 for 43 in Breeders' Cup. So he doesn't have that on him anymore. He's He's been very engaging this week, and uh, it's been wonderful to see. So I'm, I'm very happy for him that he has this horse at this time, and we'll see if we can all be happy at the same time. 
enjoying flight line on Saturday here at Keeneland. My thanks again to Ed DeRosa, Sarah L. Badwi, and Jeff Bessa. Don't forget, if you simply are listening to this episode after midday Thursday, you can see all of us in the video version on the Horse Racing Nation YouTube page after that point. Until our regular Friday episode with Todd Pletcher, Aiden O'Brien, Wesley Ward, Peter Miller, and Costa Ronas, this is Ron Flatter with this from the 2022 Breeders' Cup Horseman's Information Guide. A jockey is not permitted to wear advertising or promotional materials within one hour before or after a race unless the material falls within an exception as explained below or prior permission is obtained.